Let's read our text of Scripture. I want to reread to you this morning, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 to 13, uh, or actually 8 to um, 19. So will you stand with me, or right to the end of the chapter, actually. Will you stand with me as we read that this morning? Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 to the end of the chapter. The Apostle Paul, of course, is speaking, and he says to the believers at Ephesus, To me who am less than the least of all the saints... This grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God." Now, unto, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. This morning we finally get to Paul's prayer. Uh, he He wanted to pray for them from the very beginning of the chapter, and uh, he he initiated a a phrase that was leading into prayer, but then he decided to tell them something before he prayed for them. And so there is a large, what we call parenthetical passage, a parenthesis, or a, a section that has been inserted there before he prays because he wants them to understand something. And I I think sometimes as believers, we need to take time before we pray to make sure that we understand things. I think often as Christians, there are many things that we don't understand. And we need to have clarity and understanding. But this morning, he's going to begin praying for them after having explained those things to them. And I'll refer to them occasionally during the message. But I want us to look at verses 14, 15, and 16, and, and look at how he starts. He says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family and heaven and earth is named. That's a very interesting phrase. First of all, he calls us a family. You know, when you observe the church sometimes, you might think, well, they're not much of a family. They're not acting much like a family. But we are a family. That's God's intent. God's intent is that the body of Christ, we be a family. Not only on earth, but we're connected to a family in heaven. And I don't know that the reference there is maybe to saints who have already died and gone to heaven, or to angelic beings, but I do know that he's talking here about a family that is bigger than we can imagine. The whole family in heaven and earth that is named by the name of Jesus Christ, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. I just want to look at that part this morning because I think it's so important that we get a grasp of that as He, as he enters in onto the prayer. So we finally come to this prayer, and you'll remember that in the first verse of chapter 3, the apostle Paul begins by saying, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, he's going to say, I pray for you. 
but he stops and he thinks, they've got to understand certain things first. I want them to understand. And so from verse 2 all the way to verse 13 is a preliminary explanation that they need to understand so that they'll realize what his prayer is all about. And you'll notice in your Bible there might be a little dash in verse 1 after the word Gentile. There might be some kind of a little symbol there that indicates he's going to talk about something else now. Well, he does that, and we've studied that over the last several weeks. And the primary thing that he talks about is the mystery. The mystery that in the past was not revealed, but now is revealed. And we learn that that revelation has come particularly through the Apostle Paul. That he's the one who is revealing, teaching the church. He's revealing to them the great mystery that was unknown before, that now all peoples can be part of the body of Christ. That now God is not isolated just to the Jewish people as a nation, but that now the gospel opens up the door to access with God to anyone in the world from any nation, any language, any culture. Anyone can come to Christ. Listen, my dear Gentile friends, you ought to rejoice at that. Because if God hadn't changed that, we'd still be in our sin. Because the nations were pagan. The Gentiles were pagan. And Israel wasn't an angel, but in comparison to the world she was. Because she had the truth of God. She had the oracles of God. But because God in His purpose had held a mystery in place, the one day He would reveal that all men could be part of the family of God. And so in this long parenthetical passage, he wants us to understand something. He takes 12 verses to explain to the Ephesians and by transmission to us also the mystery that was hidden in ancient times, but that now has been given to him to reveal to the church that we Gentiles can now be part of that body and that the church is composed of all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is composed of all of those who have acknowledged their sin. Let me ask you something. Have you acknowledged your sinfulness to God? Have you ever come to God and said, Lord, I recognize that I'm a sinner, that I have failed you, I, I, I am convicted of my sin. As I read the Word of God, I'm convicted of my sin, and I recognize that I am a sinner, and I know that I have to repent because your Son says that unless we repent, we will perish. And I come to you in humble repentance, asking you to forgive my sins. Have you ever done that? If you have never done that, then you're not part of this family. You need to, that's, that's, that's entrance, that's class 101 on entrance into the kingdom of God. Repentance towards sin and faith in Jesus Christ. So those who have turned to God in repentance, admitting their inability to do anything to atone for their sin. That's one of the things I find the hardest. I wish I could do something to atone for my sin, but I can't. Their inability to please God in any way other than by absolute obedience and have placed their faith in Christ and His sacrificial death for them and that that death atones for their sin. It pays. It satisfies the just demands of God. It is the divine means that God has given for the forgiveness of the sins of men. There is no other way. God did not give us any other provision. He did not give us any other way for the sins of men to be forgiven other than through the sacrifice of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Other than by His death. There is not a church in the world that saves anybody. There is not a minister in the world that can save anybody. There is not a sacrament in the world that can save anybody. There is nothing outside of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ that can save the souls of men. And all those who believe and accept that, turning from their own righteousness to seek the righteousness of God in Christ, are those who make up the body of Christ. The visible body of believers, and that is a creation of God. 
I always want to impress on people that we are part of a family that God has created. You did not join a club when you became a member of Verdun LaSalle Baptist Church. You didn't even join an association. You became part of a body when you trusted Christ as your Savior. And when you associated yourself to this local church, you became part of the visible body of Christ, the visible family of God. And so your role is extraordinarily important in this family. Your work is extremely important in this family. Your testimony is extremely important in this family. And not only this, but God has chosen to use the church, the body of saved and sanctified believers, to demonstrate the multifaceted beauty of His grace. He's using the church to teach the world the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable is not a word that means you can't find it. It, It's a word that means you can't get to the bottom of it. It is so deep. It is so great. It's so immense. I could stand up here and preach 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a whole year, all of my life, and never get to the bottom of everything that we have in Christ. It is that rich. It is that great. Now, why is that important for the Ephesians to understand? Why is it important for us to understand? Why would Paul take 12 verses to explain that so carefully to the believers? Well, it was important because they needed to appreciate it. They needed to appreciate the unity that God had placed in the church, in the body of Christ. That the church is something unlike anything else in the world. It's something unlike the world has ever seen. It is a closely knit body of men and women who have a singular goal, a singular purpose, and that to proclaim the glory of God in Jesus Christ to the world, to proclaim salvation in Jesus' name. And so it is our work as a body of believers, as Paul says a little later, to maintain the unity of the body. You know what that means? That means that unity doesn't happen automatically. You know, I'm part of a biological family. I have a mom and a dad. I have siblings. I have relatives. And as a family, we have worked very hard at keeping the unity of our family. My mother, every year, has a special family reunion where she calls everybody in the family, my brothers, my sisters, their children, uh, my, my, my son's wives, their children, some of our relatives, and we all get together at her place every year. We go to the cemetery to have a little memorial service for my dad. Then we come back home. My dad loved to eat steak. My mother makes it a point all year to buy steak on sale, put it in the freezer, and there are 40 steaks available. Nobody eats hamburger on that day at our place. My mom has 40 plus steaks available and we've got two guys barbecuing and we have steak the way dad liked to have steak. My mom knows something about unity of a family. She really does. She has kept us together all these years. She turns 92 next month. There are a lot of 92 year old women who would be doing a lot of other kinds of things than that. But my mom keeps going, and I believe that keeps her going. She sees to it every year, and every year I have some well-meaning relatives who say to her, Rita, you shouldn't do this. This is too much. And I want to take them into a room somewhere and give them a good talking to and remind them that that's keeping my mother alive. Well, not really, but it's keeping her going. It's motivating. She's already talking about it. I'm going down to see her next Tuesday. She said, don't forget to come. The steaks are on sale at Loblaws. And we're going to go steak shopping. I know it. The benefit of that is I usually get one for lunch. So that's kind of nice. But she she knows what what it is to maintain the unity of the family. And brothers and sisters in Christ, I think sometimes we fail terribly. For which we will be accountable someday. 
We fail terribly in maintaining the unity of the body. It's important for us to be together. Listen, you had all week to do everything you have to do. You had six days to see to your personal business. Today is God's day. Today is family day. If I were to call my mother and say, you know what, Mom, I can't go to the family, she'd say, what? What? You're not coming? Don't you realize how important this is and you're the oldest one in the family? And yeah, we'd go through the whole litany. I would never be able to get off that hook. And out of respect for my mother, I wouldn't want to be off the hook. But you know, in the body of Christ, sometimes we so little understand the importance of the body that we will use any excuse to be away from it. Listen, on Sunday morning, I need to see you here. And you need to see me here. That's important. It's important that the body of Christ be together. What if I got up on a Sunday morning and said, oh, I don't think I'll go this morning. I've got something else to do. What would you do with me? You do that to me sometimes. <laughs> what should I do with you? <laughs> I just want you to get my point. I think this aspect of the unity of the body is extremely important. I sometimes wonder if it's the lack of unity that causes our church not to grow, that makes maybe our evangelism ineffective that makes our, our communion not filled with the joy that it should be. Because no one really wants, well, I shouldn't say no one, but maybe a lot of people don't want to put the effort forward. It requires effort, doesn't it? To maintain the unity of the body. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have told us if it was an automatic thing. It requires effort. I've been in the church long enough to know. I mean, I got saved when I was 19. I'm 61. Do the math. I've been in the church long enough to know. You know, I, I, I came to the church as a single guy. I was going to say that was a great day, but my wife's here. It's kind of insulting, isn't it? It wasn't a great day. I was looking for a wife. But uh, I came to the church as a single guy, and I wanted a Christian wife, and I met Jill there. And then I continued in the church as a married couple. And, and we enjoyed the communion of the church. We loved the church. It was our family. And then we started having our kids, and we dragged our kids to the church. I was listening to a preacher the other day, actually John MacArthur was giving a sermon. He said he grew up in the parking lot of a church. I thought, that's interesting. He grew up in the parking lot of a church. That means he spent all the, and he started to enumerate that his whole life as a young person was in the church. Is it any wonder that he's a pastor today and successful pastor being used of God because he knew what it was to be attached to the church? He says he was in the church Sunday morning, Sunday night, during the week. He was at the church all the time. We dragged our kids to church every Sunday. We dragged them to church Sunday morning, dragged them to church Sunday night, dragged them, well, we didn't drag them to prayer meeting. We alternated before I was in the ministry. One week I'd go, one week Jill would go, we'd kind of alternate. And, uh, but our kids grew up in the church. And there may be a lot of things wrong with my kids, but there's one thing they've got straight is that they're all in church this morning because they grew up understanding what it meant to be part of the body of Christ. That this is our life. This is what mom and dad belong to. And, and we set the tone. You know, I, I went through that whole thing of my kids wanting to play hockey on Sunday and all the rest. I said, look, when you're on your own, you can do what you want, but while you live under my roof, Sunday's the Lord's day, and no hockey team is going to drag you out of church on Sunday. And I know parents that are paying a great price today because they didn't impress upon their children the importance of being in church on Sunday. I know parents who have children who want nothing to do with church today because they never taught their children the importance of being in church on the Lord's Day. And, and I'm telling you that because I think it's important. I have the right to tell you that because of my age and where I am in life. I've raised a family. I know what it is. It's extremely important and some of you will cry one day over your children because you didn't make the Lord's Day the priority for your kids. And they grew up realizing that it wasn't that important. How important it is to get that, and that's all connected to the unity of the body. That's all connected to the importance of being the body of Christ. 
and having that singular goal. And if the church doesn't understand her unity, she will fail in her task. If she failed to see the importance of her life as part of a body, she would soon be torn apart. And already there were those who wanted to destroy the church. She needed to understand the unity that God was calling her to. She, she was to survive. She needed to understand that Christ was her head and only full and total allegiance to Him would ever give her life. And you and I would not live together very long as a church if we were not united in Christ. There's enough to divide us very, very quickly. You know, in the body of Christ, we get on, get on each other's nerves quickly enough that it doesn't take much to send us off each in our own direction. But it's because of the unity that we have in Christ. We could soon be at each other's necks and divided, but Christ is our head, and that's what holds us together. And so Paul is adamant that they understand this truth. And verses 2 to 13 is a kind of a a wrap-up of everything he's taught them in the first two chapters of Ephesians. And now he, he wants to offer this prayer for them, and he feels that he has to reiterate the truths of God, the great work of God, this mystery that has been revealed to them that they are part of a body. And do they understand what that body life is that is Jews and Gentiles? They're one body. Now he's going to pray for them, and it's a beautiful prayer. It's a beautiful prayer that speaks of the importance of that unity. And I want us to to look at the first three verses and look at the foundation of the prayer by noting the the attitude that Paul has in prayer, the position of his prayer, then the privilege, and finally the content, and the content will take a few weeks, the content of the petition that he makes to God through Jesus Christ for believers at Ephesus. First of all, he speaks of the position, and that's our first point, the position of prayer. He says in verse 14, for this reason... I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that Paul has enumerated to the Ephesians in these first three chapters of Ephesians have had a a profound effect on him. And they should have a profound effect on us as believers. We should be moved by these things that we've learned. And it would be good to stop and just for a few moments kind of review what it is Paul has said up to this point. What are some of the things that he has told us so that we can appreciate the facts just like the Ephesians did? He taught us things that we could not know outside of him telling us in this letter. He had had not given them, had he not given them to us in this letter, we would probably be clueless about them. But he tells us that as the people of God, We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That means that divine things affect our life. Divine realities affect our life. That we're in communication, we're in contact with divinity. It's amazing. That we're in touch with God, the creator of the universe. It's an amazing fact. You know, we sang this morning, immortal, invisible, God only wise. What's the next line? Does anybody remember it? In light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. That gives us a picture that God is so glorious that we can't even see Him. And yet Paul tells us here that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That God is communicating with us. He's relating with us spiritual realities. Then he tells us that he has chosen us before the foundation of the world. I don't know about you, but I love that. I love the fact that God has chosen me. I can't understand why some people can't rejoice in that truth. I think it's great. If it was only me choosing God, I'd be a little bit concerned about that. But when I read that God chose me, that He drew me, it's a blessing. We learn that He wants us to be a holy people and blameless before Him. 
He wants us to be a separate people, a, a people that are set apart from the world, that are different from the world. I, I've shared with you many times that I love reading the Puritans. And, and you know something? The Puritans were the Puritans because they were the Puritans. I don't know if you got all that. But they were the Puritans because they saw themselves as separate from the world. They saw themselves as a group of people that were not like the world. That's what created and developed and, and unified them. Because there was nobody else in the world they could relate to other than sharing the gospel with them. Their family was the church. Their strength was the body. And so as you read them, they're constantly relating. They had a great understanding of body life, of church life. Then he tells us that in love, in love he predestined us to adoption through Jesus Christ. That means that you were in the, what do you call a place where adopted kids are? Orphanage. You were in the orphanage of sin. I'm working on an illustration here. You were in the orphanage of sin. And what happens to kids who are in an orphanage? Do they send out letters to prospective parents? No, of course they don't. They just sit there and wait. And we were in the orphanage of sin and Christ came and adopted us into his family. That means that he did it, not us. Every way you look at this and turn it around on its top, on its side, whichever way, it always comes out the same. That it's our salvation is God's work. That he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. And that all this is according to the good pleasure of his will. God does what he wants for his pleasure. And I'm glad that we're part of the pleasure. That he did it for his pleasure. He chose us. And he says that it might be to the praise of the glory of his grace. That it might bring praise to God. When I get to heaven and, and I see the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm just going to want to praise and rejoice in His name that He came and delivered me out of the bondage of sin and set me free, set my feet on a rock, Jesus Christ, and that He made me accepted in the Beloved. That's what Paul says. He made me accepted in Christ. I was praying this week and telling God how I realized how unworthy I am. But how thankful I am that in Christ, He has made me His. You watch how you treat me because I'm a son of God. And I'm going to watch how I treat you because you're a child of God. And we ought to be careful about how we treat each other because we are part of God's family. And God don't mess around with His kids. He doesn't allow His children to mess around with each other and get away with it. Now, I had a very observant mother when I grew up. She watched carefully the interreaction of our family. And I'll tell you, sometimes we felt the heat of a wrath because we weren't treating each other properly in the family. And sometimes God disciplines us quite severely because of that. So we need to be cautious of that. Now, these are just a few of the things that Paul has revealed to us here in Ephesians. And, and the problem is that too often as Christians, we don't stop to reflect on that. We don't stop to reflect on those truths and so we, we miss the significance and the wonder of it. We don't appreciate what it means that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. We don't appreciate that. Perhaps we don't even value the spiritual blessings because maybe we're too focused on the material things. We're too focused on this life. And the spiritual dimension of our life becomes very weak and pathetic and anemic we're so wrapped up in the things of this life. I'm glad I'm getting older. Because I find as you get older, you start detaching. I'm starting to detach. I, I, I'm, I'm starting, you know, I, I'm on my way out, let's face it. And, and I'm, I'm happy about that. I wouldn't go back. Sometimes I think, you know, would I go back and start all over again? Well, there, the only reason I'd want to go back and start all over again is to live right for God. And, and, and avoid some of the pitfalls that I fell into. Avoid some of the sins that I committed in my youth that I regret and that I'm paying for today. But you know something? Right now at this stage that I'm in, there might be 10, 20, maybe 30 years left in my life. And that's not long in the big scheme of things. But I'm kind of glad that it's all over. I wouldn't want to start all over again. 
I, I, have, I have found life hard. I don't know about you. I have personally found life very hard. It's not been easy. I have not had an easy time in life. I found it very difficult. And I was saying to the Lord, Lord I'm, I'm anxious. I'm, I'm looking forward to being in your presence. I'm looking forward to leaving all this behind. There's really nothing that I really hold to that I want to keep. I want to be with you. That's my great desire. That's what I long for more than anything else. Because I've been born spiritually, and so my aspirations are now to spiritual things. I have to live on the earth. That's, that's the inevitable reality of becoming a Christian. You have to stay here until it's time to go home. And the Apostle Paul understood that. He said, I, I would far rather be with the Lord than to be here. But if I'm here, it's because I realize that God wants me here. There's still work to do. But you know, because we've been saved by God's grace, we need to have our eyes fixed on spiritual things. Earthly things. You know, we're going to get to heaven one day. We're going to look back at all the material, earthly things that bogged us down, and we're going to so regret it. We're going to so regret that we allowed all these things to bog us down in our Christian life. We could have been so much more serviceable to God if we hadn't let all these things overwhelmed us, overwhelm us and wrap themselves around us. But you know something? Only those born of the Spirit can understand that. If you haven't been born of the Spirit, then that, that had, it doesn't make any sense. But if you've been born of the Spirit, you understand what I'm talking about. Because that's what spiritual people think about. Because we are spiritual. That's what the Bible says. We're no longer in the flesh, we're in the Spirit. And so spiritual things are important. You know something? Nobody understands music like a musician. That's a fact. Nobody understands literature like a writer. Nobody understands the universe like a scientist. And nobody understands art like an artist. And no one understands spiritual things other than one who has been born of the Spirit. And so what I'm talking about this morning is a spiritual dimension. That's what Paul's talking about. He says, this is the spiritual dimension of your life. It's not a disconnect. You're not fleshly one day and spiritual the other. If you're a Christian, you're in the Spirit. You're a spiritual being. And you're either starving the Spirit and feeding the flesh, or as you should be, starving the flesh and feeding the Spirit. You can't do both. It's one or the other. And what does that understanding do? Well, contrary to knowledge, which puffs up and makes proud, understanding makes one humble. That humbles us. That makes us realize that we're dependent upon God for understanding. We're going to be talking about this later on this afternoon in Psalm 119, where David talks about the difference in knowledge and understanding. It's one thing to have knowledge. There are people that have great knowledge, but no understanding. A big difference. Listen, I will, I will propose to you that there are Christians who have a lot of knowledge but no understanding of how to live the Christian life. They just can't put it into real time. They have a hard time with it. They know what the Bible says but they have a hard time practicing it. But God's given us a whole lifetime to do that. A whole lifetime to learn how to live spiritually, to live in the spiritual dimension. But sometimes as Christians, we're like, we're like people who have their two feet in a cement bucket. We can't get out of it. Only God can get us out. We need to understand from a spiritual perspective. That's why Jesus said in the Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who understand their spiritual poverty. Blessed are those who understand their spiritual poverty because they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. We ought to take our cue from that verse that God values spiritual understanding. That He values that we understand sp things in a spiritual dimension. And so Paul shows us here in, in, in this verse in Ephesians his attitude as he comes to understand these great truths. That God has been so gracious to him that God has so graciously revealed these truths to him, listen to his words. They're, they're the language of humility. He says in verse 14, for this reason. What reason? Everything I've just told you since chapter 1. 
Everything I've just told you in this parenthetical passage from chapter 3, verse 2 to verse 12. All of those things that I have just told you, because of this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The truth that Paul has enumerated have had such a profound effect on his life that they have caused him to bow the knee in adoration to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does your knowledge of the Word of God and its principle change your life? Does your understanding of the Word of God cause you to be transformed day after day? I'm not not talking about one transformation. I'm talking about the fact, does your knowledge of the Word of God constantly transform you? You know, I was reading this morning in 2 Chronicles. That's where I am in my Scripture reading. And I was reading about all those kings. A lot of kings. God is faithful to His promise. He told David that He'd see His sons on the thrones of Israel. And there were kings on the throne. And uh, David, uh, the Word of God says, you know, such and such a man became king and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he, was, he died and he was buried with his fathers. And then another king came to the throne and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And another king came and he did what was... And then all of a sudden after six or seven kings, he got one and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. I was saying to myself, what does this mean to me, Lord? And the answer came back very quickly. Will you do what is right in the sight of the Lord or will you do what is evil in the sight of the Lord? I put those kings in position. I allowed them to rule my nation. I allowed them to come to the throne. But they had to decide, are they going to do evil or are going to do right? And most of them did evil. And I learned something new again this morning. That as a pastor, as a le- I'm not a king, but as a pastor, as a leader of the people, I have a choice to make. Am I going to do what's evil or am I going to do what's right? Am I going to be a pastor for my own benefit? The Bible says, you know, don't, don't do this for filthy lucre. Don't do it for the paycheck. But do it because you love God and you want to serve His people. Am I going to do it for the right reason? Am I going to do it to honor God? How is it that Paul is so moved by these things and that often the average Christian is, is for the most part, unmoved by these truths? I mean, does it move you this morning to know that you were chosen by God, that you were predestined to salvation through Jesus Christ? Does it stir your heart? Does it make you love the body of Christ? Does it make you long to serve Him? That's what it did to Paul. Often we're unchanged by doctrine. Did you know that it's doctrine that changes life, not emotions and feelings oh listen sometimes i wake up in the morning i feel so great by noon hour i'm flat on my face why it's because i was depending on how i felt sometimes i get up in the morning you find this hard to believe sometimes i get up as a cranky old bear i meet jill in the hallway and i could devour her in one bite get out of my way i am going to do what i've got to do today and it usually doesn't take long that god grabs me by the neck he says, all right, Sobe, change your attitude. It usually happens when I'm shaving in the mirror. He reminds me I could slit your throat in a second, buddy. Change your attitude. I find myself praying most often for an attitude change. You know why? Because our whole life comes out of an attitude. What's my attitude? This morning I sat on the edge of the bed before my feet, because my feet don't touch the floor from our bed. It's high enough. My feet didn't touch the floor. I said, Lord, before my feet touch the floor this morning change my heart. Give me your heart. Give me your love for people, your, your love to serve other people. These are the things that change us. Why would I pray that way? Because I know what the Word of God says. I know what the Bible says. I'm, I want to fill myself with the truth. And for many Christians, these are not truths that have a changing effect in their life. It's one thing to read the Bible. It's another thing to allow the Bible to change your life. I find it shocking sometimes when Christians come to me and quote a verse, but they're doing exactly the opposite of what the verse says. What's that? What do I do with this? Do I tell them? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Depends how cross they look. But, you know, you never know. Well, I can only conclude that this happens because many Christians don't take the time to meditate on the Word of God that contains these truths They don't take the time to reflect on them. You know the word meditate means to chew. 
to chew over, has the idea of a cow, no personal comment, offense there, but a cow who is chewing and she allows the food to go down her stomach and then she regurgitates it to chew it again and then sends it down into her second stomach. And, and that's what the word meditate means. It means to reflect on it. But many people don't take the time to reflect. Sometimes we treat the Bible as such a mechanical thing. You know, I got, I got to read my 15 chapters today. I get up, and, and you don't get anything out of it. Oh, come on. Take the time. Immerse yourself in the Word of God. Let the Word of God fill you. Paul exhorted the Philippians to reflect and meditate on spiritual truth. He told them this in, in Philippians 4. Finally, brethren... It's, he's coming to the end. Finally, brethren, that's an important point. In Philippians 4, 8, if you want to look it up. But he says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Let these be the things... Paul says meditate. The word means to take into account, to think about. Think about things that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and good, of good report and virtuous and worthy of praise. And I think all of those qualifiers apply to the Word of God. All of those qualifiers apply to the Word of God because there is nothing more true, there is nothing more noble Nothing more just, nothing more pure, nothing more lovely, nothing of better report, nothing more virtuous, nothing more worthy of praise than the Scriptures. And that's what we need to be meditating on. And sometimes as Christians we get into trouble because we're meditating about all kinds of other things instead of the Word of God. And listen, what you let in through your eyes and through your ears are what you are going to meditate on. The things of this world, and the world bombards us that way. Why do you think they invented televisions and the internet and all the rest of it? These are all things that bombard us visually. And if we spend our time being bombarded by that, it's going to show in our life. We're not going to be people filled with the Word of God. We're going to be people that are filled with all kinds of other priorities, all kinds of other things that we see as important. But Paul says, look, meditate. Meditate on the Word of God. Meditate on the Scriptures. Joshua 1.8, this word of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night to do everything that it says. Then you shall have good success. Then you shall be prosperous. Anybody here doesn't want to be prosperous and have good success? Of course not. We all want to be prosperous and have good success. Well, we've got the recipe right in Scripture, Joshua 1.8. Why is it we don't listen to it? Why is it we don't get into the Word and make the Word the priority of our life? So brothers and sisters in Christ, apply yourself, not only to the reading, but to the meditation of God's Word. Don't just know a truth. Study it. Reflect on it. Understand it. Let it get a hold of your life and change you. But that won't happen if you don't reflect on that truth. You know, when I, when I read that God chose me before the foundation of the world, I've thought about that a lot. That's really had an impact on my life. Because you know what? He could have not chosen me. Whoa. He could have not chosen me. And I'd still be out there like every other person who doesn't know Christ. People be trying to witness to me and I'd be shrugging it off, unconcerned about eternity, going straight to hell. That would be my condition had God not chosen me. But because He chose me, I responded to the gospel. You see what I mean? As you begin thinking about these things, you begin reflecting, it makes me want to say, thank you, Father. Thank you. You chose me. You called me out of this sinful world to be your child. I owe you everything. I owe you my whole life because you called me to be yours. You chose me to be yours, not chose me to be mine. You chose me to be yours. So what else can I do than serve you with my entire life? What else can I do than give you everything that I am? It begins to apply to me. It begins to transform me. It begins to change me. It brings me to my knees like it did Paul. 
He says, I bow the knee to our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, secondly, it reminds him of the privilege. We're not going to go there this morning because our time has passed already. But there is a privilege of prayer. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have a privileged access to God. We have a, an open door into God's office where we can come in at any time, any time of the day, any time of the night, during any circumstances, and have access into His presence. Does that do something for you? It ought to. It ought to, because if you didn't know Christ, you wouldn't have that access. And that makes a world of difference. What a transforming truth that is. Well, we're going to leave that for another time.